First, though, let's begin by going to Father Frank Brennan, a respected human rights lawyer, Jesuit priest and longtime advocate for Indigenous constitutional recognition. He joins me live from Melbourne. Father Frank, thanks for your time. I know that you've made your submission now to this parliamentary committee on The Voice. You said that the parliamentary committee should require that the Solicitor General provide advice on whether The Voice could delay decisions in the public service. The committee should insist on the government publishing that advice. Why is that all so crucial in your mind? Yes, thanks, Kieran. Well, it seems to have come to a pointy end on this in that what people are now focusing on is whether or not the voice would be a voice not only to Parliament and to ministers, but also a voice to public servants and what we call the executive government. And that's the technical term that's in the bill at the moment. Now, if you make representations to public servants, uh, often the public servant will simply be a delegate or an agent of the minister. That's no problem. But there are two problem areas that have arisen. One is where the public servant is making a routine administrative decision, and there are thousands of them every week by public servants, on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So how is the voice to know that public servants are making decisions? What information do they need in order to do that? So that's the first problem. Now, on that, on Friday, we heard particularly trenchantly from Mr Ken Hain, respected High Court judge who chaired the constitutional expert group for the government. He said, well, no, there'd absolutely be no implication in the Constitution that the voice would be entitled to be told public servants were making decisions and they'd have no entitlement to be told uh, information so that the voice could make an informed decision. He said that would bring the system of government to a halt. It would disrupt mm. government unduly. So what we've got is the strong advocates in the legal camp for entitlements being made by the voice to executive government, including public servants, agreeing with strong no advocates like Tony Abbott saying, yeah. well, if there was this entitlement, it would disrupt government. And so well, what Ken Hain and, and other lawyers got... are saying is, look, there'd be no implication of that and Parliament could ensure it didn't happen. Mm. Yeah, yeah in, indeed. So I, I want to point the, to the that. The second that, problem um, is both where Kenneth Hain and also Anne Toomey... The Aboriginal leaders of... Sorry, um, just to pick up, Anne Toomey also said there is no obligation upon Parliament or the executive to respond to the representations or give effect to them. There is no obligation of prior consultation. There is no requirement to wait to receive a representation before the executive government uh, of parliament can act. Does that mitigate the issues you've raised around the, the reference to executive government? Well, it does in one sense, Kieran, but you say, well, why put executive government in there? If it actually means nothing, then why not make it meaningful in terms of parliament and ministers? They're the ones you're wanting to get to. Because the other point is the Aboriginal leaders have rightly said, well, we thought this would give us the power to get inside the room with public servants well before any policies were formulated so as to be at the table. Well, what they're being told clearly by this committee is that, no, this constitutional provision wouldn't do that. So let's make sure the words mean what they say. I mean, I think the political effect of this, Kieran, is, and what's important about this committee, let's remember, someone like Andrew Bragg, a leading Liberal who wants some sort of voices on the committee. What you want is wording which is sufficiently precise, which can bring the Andrew Braggs, the Julian Leases of this world on board, so we've got more chance of getting to a solid yes. That's what the real work of this committee has to be about. So do you think that there's some openness to that? Are you confident that they might listen to one of your recommendations, which seems to clear up any doubt on this, where you suggest that it should be the voice-making representations to the Parliament and Ministers of the Commonwealth, and therefore you remove any reference to executive government and any risk that public servants get caught up in it all?
Well, I don't know, reading the mood in the room on Friday, I'd say the key Indigenous leaders like Megan Davis and Marcia Langton are very keen to keep all of executive government in there, though they would have heard later in the day that it's completely meaningless. The other thing to say is the government members of the committee seem to be pretty pleased that the lawyers were saying, oh, look, you could leave executive government in there because actually it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that you'd be clogging up the system of government. It means the parliament can just get on with its business as usual, ministers can do the same, and public servants can keep doing their jobs, and there'll be no need for anything other than, as Anne Toomey said at one stage, uh, you could have an email address where you could send representations to public servants if you happen to hear a public servant were thinking of making a decision which might affect your people. So the politics of it at the moment is still fairly entrenched, but it's only been the first day of the committee, and I would hope that the question, the political question will be, both for the government members and for the Aboriginal leaders, why die in a ditch on keeping executive government rather than just ministers and parliament in there when you've now been told by your best legal advisers that, look, if you actually had what you wanted, it would clog up the system of government and Parliament will ensure that doesn't happen, so what you're wanting is actually fairly meaningless. So why not try and get the brags and leases of the world aboard? That would be my thinking, but of course I'm not at the table. Professor Megan Davis, who you mentioned there, part of that uh, Indigenous working group and a, a key advisor in all of this, she said that clearly the voice will be able to speak to all parts of government, including public servants, agencies like uh, the Reserve Bank, Centrelink and others. But, but she argues it isn't to be feared because the explanatory memorandum of the, the change says the parliament will be able to set the procedure through which the voices' representations are received. Are, are you again placated by the fact that that parliamentary oversight remains? No, I'm left with the situation that Megan Davis and Anne Toomey clearly disagreed with each other at the committee on Friday. And so what we need is clarity on these things. I keep coming back here into the great saying of Bob Ellicott, the late Bob Ellicott, who was Attorney General, with three of the eight successful referendums in Australian history. He said, rule one, you've always got to ensure that there's no complexity or ambiguity, particularly about legal questions. So you need clarity about the scope which is there. I think Megan Davis's argument is quite a plausible argument. Uh, but she's got the Ann Toomey's of this world saying, no, it wouldn't apply to things like the Reserve Bank, to Centrelink, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, things which Megan Davis and other Aboriginal leaders think should be within the scope. So, once again, the job of the committee is it's a good opportunity. This is the first transparent public opportunity we've had for an airing of what's in the proposed bill, get some clarity, get certainty, and then we can move forward. And hopefully, as I say, get the brags and leases of this world on board. Indeed, as much bipartisanship as possible uh, would make it, you would think, the cause a bit easier. As someone who has advocated for Indigenous recognition and rights for most of your life, will you st still advocate a yes vote, even if the current wording remains? Well, we have to wait till we get there, uh, Kieran. At the moment, this is the first time we've had an open, transparent parliamentary process. Let's do the hard work to try and get the wording as good as we can. As I've said in my submission, if they were to replace the word executive government uh, with ministers of state, then I would completely recommend that the bill be passed by the parliament. And then we can move on to the next stage of the active campaign for getting to yes in the referendum. But at the moment, the critical task is to do the difficult work, particularly as we have heard so trenchantly from Kenneth Hayne, that if Aboriginal people were right in thinking that this provision would give them the entitlement to
to know what public servants were up to, to get enough information from public servants so they could make informed representations, then they've got to understand they've been sadly misled on that and that there is no way, according to Hayne or Bob French, that the High Court would ever find such an implication and that there's every way that the Parliament will legislate under the Clause 3, as it's called, to ensure that that never happens. So we've got to all get real as to what it is that we're actually wanting to achieve through this constitutional change. We want substance in there. We want people to be able to look at it and say, yes, we've got access to Parliament. We've got access to ministers. But in terms of public servants, where they're acting as an agent or a delegate for the minister, we've got access. But on other things, it would have to be done by legislation and it can't be done constitutionally. So you're not yet convinced that the benefits would outweigh the risks inherent in the wording, in your view? Well, I'm simply going on what people like Ken Hayne and Robert French, who are far more expert in constitutional law than I am, have said, that namely, leaving it as it is, if you were to go to say that there should be a capacity for Aboriginal people to be informed what public servants are deciding, and if Aboriginal people were to be informed of enough information about what was being decided so as to make informed representations, they say that will clog up the system of government. It'll make it unworkable. They are on the same page as Tony Abbott on that. So that's why we need to get some clarity.